Welcome to the Accountants Connection webinar series sponsored by Your Business First. Good afternoon, good morning everyone from wherever we are around Australia. Darren Sherry here, CEO and Principal Consultant of Your Business First. Today we have the pleasure of having Peter Loosely, founder of Virtual IT Managed Services, presenting today on the topic of, are your staff remote or working from home? What do you need to know about cyber threats, how to protect your business and how to fight back? With the whole world being affected by the coronavirus, many businesses are at best enabling their team to work from home. Peter will talk to you today about uh, industry best practices and things to consider as you look to provide a better, more secure remote working solution for your employees and yourselves and solutions are secure and are quick to implement. Thank you to those who have already submitted a question or burning issue to Peter. If you have a question during the webinar, please feel free to click the Q&A button to enter your question and we'll attempt to answer it accordingly and of course anonymously. And at the end of Peter's presentation, we'll go through this uh, within, uh, we'll go through this. Peter has a lot of content and knowledge to share with us today and in this hour, so let's get straight into it. So Peter, welcome and thanks again for your time today, mate. Thank you very much, Darren, for um, the opportunity to present here. Um, I'd just like to actually um, welcome everybody to um, this webinar and thank actually your business first for giving us the opportunity to share. That's fine, thank you. So first off, I suppose this is normally a presentation I've given live. So um, uh, like everybody else, we're also actually affected by the corona coronavirus um, and also having to actually look at new and innovative ways to operate our business. The image that you see on the screen right now is what I would depict as what most people have actually understood to be um, what a hacker is. All right. What we're trying to do on this series is to see if we can actually debunk actually what a hacker is and also give you some ideas as to how you can fight back and what you need to do. So can I get, uh, is there a way in which we can actually get people to maybe uh, give us some feedback in the chat as to whether this would be what they would consider um, is the typical media um, representation of a hacker? Yeah. yeah, please feel free to put those, those thoughts and comments in the Q&A section. Anyway, as we move forward, why are we here? So with over 30 years in technology, I've seen many um, areas of business. We've uh, worked in uh, retail, uh, we've worked in commercial, and we've worked in large enterprise businesses. With each one of our businesses that uh, we've worked in, uh, the main paramount has always actually been the security. Uh, that's been, whether it be in the gaming industry or whether it actually be when I was IT manager for um, a large airport corporation and even a research company. Security has always been paramount actually in our business and in actually um, my background. In 2015, um, a situation arose where it gave me an opportunity to start, our, start my own business, which is when I started Virtual IT Managed Services. This was actually due to a contact that uh, reached out to me because they'd been affected by what was then fairly new on the market, the first ransomware attack. Um, this company had actually had six uh, ransomware attacks in a period of about seven months. Uh, most of their business being a large, huge organization of about a thousand odd seats was severely affected by this. We worked with that company um, over a year and effectively you know, secured their business down to the point where for the last uh, three, four years, they've never had a single incident again. It raised a concern because what I actually looked at was that there was a lot of businesses, small businesses especially, that were not being protected significantly, yet their risk was just as great, if not greater. Most small businesses are not set up with the large budget and the large funding nor do they have actually the IT um, expertise in the background to actually help them over some of their challenges. Small businesses invariably are becoming the target point now for a lot of criminal organisations because of the they are considered low-hanging fruit. So what started them was a new era of cybercrime. And this is also when I believe the um, Australian government put forward the Notifiable Data Breach Scheme. Uh, which then started making companies and directors very liable actually for um, the risk actually they were facing. So it became our mission to bring a security focus to owners and staff of all small businesses um, who can avoid getting breached. What we're trying to do is prevent actually that um, uh, encrypted screen actually occurring on people's desktops. So 
let's actually try to understand what the evolution of cybercrime is. Why is it happening? So <clears throat> we look at 1986 when the very first computer virus came out. This was a very simplistic solution. And this is just a little bit of history about where um, viruses, programs, and hackers actually evolved from. Ransomware attack was originally um, uh, spread by uh, a floppy disk, and that was in 1989. So it's not actually brand new, this concept of ransomware. It's been around for a while. Um, the I Love You Worm came out in 2000. The I Love You Worm was an interesting one. It was not malicious per se, but uh, it was the first concept of a program or a virus that could actually tra traverse uh, a network. In other words, go from machine to a machine. Right? Normally, actually, obviously, if it was a virus that was spread by a floppy disk, it would be independent to each machine the floppy disk was put into. When a worm was developed, this allowed it to actually not require a floppy disk, and hence it could traverse a network. In 2002, there was the creation of the dark web. Now, there's a whole heap of people that talk about this dark web as a uh, very scary place, but its original conception was by the US government. <laughs> Strangely enough, in 2002, the FBI then created the cyber division to protect against the dark web, which is a bit of an oxymoron if you look at that. 2008, we saw the creation of a Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Now, in its time, this was meant to be legendary, but then um, it then started showing uh, the ability of the cyber criminals to then ask for money and be totally anonymized. There was a high profile um, Google attack actually in 2010, which is when the IP, uh, the hackers, uh, the Chinese hackers actually pinched a whole heap of intellectual property from Google. This became quite notable that it was a new way of um, being attacked across the internet. 2014, we saw um, the Home Depot actually uh, had 50 million credit cards stolen. This was a um, state-sanctioned uh, attack through China. The WannaCry was obviously where most media actually then got hold of this. This was a global attack, a ransomware attack that uh, affected over 150 countries. Now, the thing is from 2019, in fact, now 2020 and belong, criminal organizations and nation states and other users capitalize on these tools. These tools are really simple. Now, you can actually Google some of this stuff and you can actually buy these tools actually off the internet, right? You can, it, it is a huge marketplace now. Uh, simple things such as actually tools of the trade exploit kits. These are just downloadable applications. You don't need to actually be a, a hacker or an expert in programming. It's a done for you service, right? You can actually even get onto the best hacking tools actually available for 2017 edition. That's about $100 to actually download and buy this. And then you've got the ultimate net tools. These are simple things that um, 17 year old uh, bored children are actually downloading and saying, well, what devastation can I create? Because it's, they don't see the fallout as to what's happening to your business. They just see that they have an opportunity to actually have an effect, right? So we actually start looking at where the cybercrime is on the dark web. Now we, we talked about the dark web before. Now, if we, if we actually look at it, at the very top, you'll see the World Wide Web. Right? This is where normally most people exist. This is where your um, movies um, are advertised. This is where your Google searches go. This is where, um, if you wanted to check the, uh, the Bureau of Meteorology, this is your general public websites. Then we actually have what's below that is actually deemed to be the dark web. Now, the simplest way to understand the dark web is anything that you require a login to, to get to, a user account and an authentication, that you could consider is the deep web, right? Sorry, yes, the deep web. So the deep web is things like your Netflix. If you wanted to log into your Netflix account and it says, can you give us your username and password? If you want to access your Gmail, if you want to access your Office 365, if you want to actually see even your work, uh, SharePoint solution, um, these are actually deemed to be the deep web. Now, the dark web is the area that you can't get to by mistake, right? It does not consist of a normal browser and a normal Chrome Explorer or um, uh, other style of browser it doesn't naturally just go there. You need specialized programs. So you can't by mistake get to the dark web. Even if you search it and click on a link, it won't send you to the dark web, right? This is actually a very anonymized style browsers. 
Now, the problem is this is in the dark web where your credentials are usually sold. So if somebody hacks into your system or finds actually your solutions, they actually sell them onto the dark web. These solutions or these credentials are then actually tested on the open web to find out if they can find other ways of getting into your backend system, right? To find out whether in fact your Gmail account, which they've managed to actually hack into, is also the same password that you're using for your Facebook, is also the same password that you're using for your um, work credentials, right? So it takes usually most people about 197 days. This is on an average of what we've actually taken from organizations to actually identify that they've had a data breach. Now it only takes actually 19 minutes um, based on um, research that was actually found um, through um, uh, this Russian hacker. They actually found that they could take 19 minutes from credentials to actually create a breach actually in a backend system. So the problem that you actually see here is that time is not on your side. It takes you 197 days and it takes them 19 minutes. Imagine the devastation that they can do as soon as they've actually got even one of your credentials. So the thing is you look at it and you go, well, why and where? You see, the problem that we've actually got is most people run business for one specific reason, and that is to make a profit, right? And make no mistake that cyber criminals are in a business and their objective is to make a profit. You, unfortunately, are their unwilling client, right? So if you actually have a look at this screen, I know it's a little bit detailed, but what we're actually gonna explain here is if you look at the top right-hand corner, you see Kingpin. Normal corporations and normal businesses would call that a CEO or a managing director. Then you would actually have the technical manager under that. We call them CIOs, Chief Information Officers. You actually have a manager, uh, money operations manager, you would call that a CFO. You have an operations manager, similar role. Within this whole organization structure, this actually is no different to any other major corporation. And make no mistake, they are well-funded and well-organized. They actually have their own help desk, would you believe? <laughs> if you have problems, in where you can't pay their ransomware, you can contact their help desk and they will walk you through the process. They wanna make it as easy as possible for you to actually resolve your problem. Let's face it, that's their business now. So if we start to look at it, we go, well, how do they actually make some money? Well, selling actually online is very lucrative, right? To actually have a look at this, this is a simple, if you understand what the cyber criminal elements are doing, they have within the dark web, the simplest term I could explain would be it is eBay for criminals, right? On the dark web site, you can actually buy things like remote access Trojans for $200. You can actually buy PC malware installations for a dollar each. You can buy software, payment gateways. You can actually um, also obtain personal information or data, right? So to actually look at the services though that they offer, they can also actually set you up with services, which is basically um, criminal service elements um, doing hacking as a service, right? For $100 per email account, right? $100 for social media accounts. They will actually use um, $20 actually for um, uh, trying to hack into a pr private virtual network or VPN, right? They can actually do $20 for 500 SMS flooding attacks into a business. They will do $200 for 100 email spams that are legal, right? So there is a fairly large volume of money that flows through this type of business. Now understand that this is actually only on technical um, IT type related matters, but within the dark web, trust me, they actually have uh, guns for hire, they have drugs, they have prostitution, they have every single thing that you can imagine is available for sale. This is just a very small portion of that service. But you see, it's also, there's another arm to this as well. And this is where it gets really interesting, is that, uh, you've clicked something, thank you, is cybercrime is very competitive. Now, like all good businesses, you want to get the best talent possible for your business. So obviously, the way you guys would do it in normal business, 
is you would go out there and actually put a job on Seek. Seek. Uh, you would put it actually on other types of um, uh, online solutions to actually try to get the best talent you can. Well, the cyber criminals are no different. So they actually have a, their own job board sites where they actually, in this one, they have actually asked for somebody to actually develop a virus that can actually do rates of infection. It actually needs to have a high probability of actually infecting, free from uh, crypting services and easy administration. Now their payment or what they are offering is if this person can actually infect on average 25 uh, devices for as many as they send out, they will get actually five Bitcoins. If they actually increase the rate of infection, their value goes up to 125 Bitcoins. 85% of the value basically comes back to them for every dollar that's made. So it's profit sharing. And the bonuses for actually doing a really good job are quite substantial. So we start actually looking actually at the vectors, right? Now the threat vectors are how the bad guys get in. So in this next video, in this uh, next chapter, what I'd like you to do, I'm gonna show you a video. It's only a four minutes, so it is actually quite quick, right? We're gonna actually start to look at ways that they actually do some social engineering, some uh, public um, uh, social engineering for a private and actually public and company. We're gonna look at actually the way that they do URL hijacking for a domain name, email phishing campaigns, ransomware. We're gonna see extortion, data exfiltration, industrial espionage and insider trading. All in this four minute video, which actually just shows you one singular event that is gonna happen. So please enjoy the video and then we'll be back in a couple of minutes. How did you decide to become a hacker? Well, I'm not really sure.
the right to learn just to distract them. They got it back. They got everything. Customer data, financials, everything. Well, the guard is free today from the news that hackers have released a personal invasion of the American people. Hey, let's take a look at the hardware. Down 14% on news that they're missing data breach. Maybe far worse. The next thing is that the all time long on the news that CEO Mark Hannon is stepping down. After what has turned out to be one of the worst breaches of personal information in recent history. Do you feel bad about releasing the personal information? All the financials? All the money that was lost? All I did was get the files. I'm not the one that decided to release them. I'm not the one that shorted the stock. Somebody else had their reasons for that. That's my theory. I was paid to do a job when I did it well. And that's what's expected of anyone, isn't it? Anyway, market is not fine. So, it's an interesting video, what we actually saw within here, and I hope you actually picked these, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an insight as to what, what actually happened here. So, we saw some social engineering, right? The first one was obviously the soft target with the CEO's wife. Um, they actually found her on Facebook, managed to actually convince her that they were a friend from her primary school that they need to connect up with. Obviously, everyone actually remembers everybody that they went to at primary school. So uh, she wasn't aware that uh, it wasn't actually that person. And hence, they actually got a, an acceptance. From there, they managed to do social engineering for the second soft target was the sales department. Obviously, getting the sales department to um, send information. Yeah, we all want to actually make sure that we've got our branding set correctly in the emails we send out. So that gave the hacker actually a little bit more information. The URL uh, hijacking, did everybody see actually the Qualcart.com um, actually changed from the I to the L. Creating the email phishing campaign, the actually using the CEO signature block. I thought that was quite clever. Right, then there was the ransomware attack. Now the email was supplied um, uh, by, the second back, uh, by the second party with the backdoor access, right? The ransomware payment, I did some calculations, 172 bitcoins in today's value is $1.5 million. Exfiltration was actually the, uh, was what they saw with the company data actually was attacked and downloaded. That was obviously part of the attack sector. And then that information was sent to that third party. Now that third party obviously then practiced insider trading because they knew that releasing that would actually devastate the stock. So they obviously actually shorted the stock and then actually release the information and watch the market tumble. So this is a very simple attack, right? Uh, and it wasn't very difficult as you can see. The, the thing is, if you actually have a look at this, it wasn't one person either. It's a coordinated effort between multiple people, right? Now what you didn't see actually in the whole thing was a kingpin who actually engaged the girl to actually start the first part of the process. Anyway, so how does phishing attacks work? Well, what we're actually going to be looking at is the concept that the attack people come across, right? And mostly what they're trying to do is convince you to actually look at an email, right? That actually looks as legitimate as it can and convince you to actually click on either the email to open it and an attachment or to actually follow a URL link and actually go to a website. This is the concept of phishing. What they're trying to do is to send it out to enough people that sooner or later, and I always always actually put this in, within every company, there is always one person that for some unknown reason will click on anything, no matter how much you try to educate them. So moving forward, what we actually had was uh, we had one site, um, a company that had a Facebook page and they had a little bit of social engineering because what happened was the uh, young girl actually at this primary school, uh, sorry, this um, uh, preschool center received a phone call from Facebook that said, hey, look, we're actually Facebook and we believe that you've got a problem with your Facebook page. We need you to actually jump onto your computer and actually I'll give you a URL, click on this link and we can actually help you uh, fix up your Facebook page because uh, there's a corruption in it. So the girl being a uh, young and inexperienced, she decided to follow their instructions because obviously, um, she was speaking to a person. Now understand Facebook, like Microsoft and other companies, don't call you 
and actually tell you you've got actually a fault. The lady actually followed the instructions of this, uh, lady, of this um, person on the phone and clicked on the link, went actually to a URL site, accepted all of the uh, downloads to allow them to take remote control of their computer. The problem actually got surfaced though when the um, person on the phone asked them for their firewall credentials because the site was actually blocked by the back end for a firewall to not let out that type of data. The alarm was raised when she actually phoned the IT department and said to them, hey, look, can you give me the firewall password so that this person can actually fix the Facebook page? And at that point, the actual network was disconnected. Um, as you can imagine, it would be rather shocking to actually find that somebody would actually just follow those instructions. So the problem we actually have is that even Microsoft, we actually see people uh, remembering that Microsoft don't phone you. And I have had multiple phone calls myself, as have my family and friends and business people. We've actually had Microsoft phoning for support and on the Microsoft website itself, it clearly states, remember Microsoft will never proactively reach out to you and provide unsolicited PC or technical support. Any communication they have with you must be initiated by you. You need to phone Microsoft, they'll never phone you, all right? Also, Microsoft actually have clearly stated in their mandated on their website that Microsoft do not actually put pop-ups with a phone number. Another lady actually uh, that we uh, received a phone call from had her PC, she went to a website and her PC suddenly started screaming and yelling and had this pop-up, call this number, it's Microsoft support urgent and it was just a browser lock. It wasn't anything uh, subdued, but it frightened her. She phoned us. Um, and it was purely that she phones this number and the person who answered said, Microsoft support, how can I help you? And obviously the response was, look, my PC is locked here. Look, if you can do this, just go to this link and download this, we can help fix your problem. That is not Microsoft. Just because they're giving you a number, it is not Microsoft support. Moving forward, so your role, how do you protect yourself and your family and your employees from this type of onslaught? especially in today's environment. I mean, the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus uh, pandemic has actually caused everybody now to uh, start looking at other ways to operate their business. More and more people are choosing to work from home. The problem that you actually see though from working from home is you are more vulnerable because you have your guard down when you're at home. They don't necessarily ring into the office and the receptionist actually blocks the calls. They don't necessarily ring into the office and actually have IT available to say, hey, look, I've got this phone call, can you help me? Small traders and sole traders that, uh, are also actually in a similar position because from home, they have their guards down because they're thinking, well, look, I've still got to deal with my clients and my business. I need to actually take on some of these phone calls, right? So what we're actually gonna to try to do is explain to you some of the basics. Now, this site, as much as it looks very detailed, don't worry about the detail, um, what it actually is key here is this is from the FBI uh, site in America. Now, strangely enough, the FBI follows what is called the Essential Eight. Now, this is actually something that is dealing with the top um, problems of ransomware and also actually how we can affect individual users. Now, the Essential Eight is what is also being promoted by the ATO and also uh, the Australian Cyber Security uh, Centre. Right, which is the Officer of Information Directorate. Now, their biggest thing on every one of these systems clearly indicates the very first thing that everybody needs to do is make sure employees are aware of ransomware and of their critical role in protecting the organization's data. That is why we put on these events, is to try to educate people that you have a serious role, you are, or well, you should be the first line of defense, not the last. It shouldn't actually get through all of the IT systems and then be left up to you to try to figure it out. You need to actually be better educated. So what can you do? So for proper password management, right, this is obviously the first step that you need to do to try to work through this situation. Strong passwords are something that should be rotated every 90 days. All right, so I'm gonna actually give you a little bit of an example as to what I believe is actually a, a good practice, is to actually have up a password that is actually easy to remember. 
Now you're going to look at that and go, well, that doesn't make, e make sense. That's an easily broken thing. Okay, so we're going to look at actually how we create a simple password here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take actually the second character, right, of this password, and we're going to capitalize the second, not the first, right? Then we're going to actually look at how many letters in total actually make up this uh, password. There was eight. So we've got an uppercase, lowercase, and a number. Then we're going to actually put in how many vowels are in there. So that'll give us our second number. There's four vowels and eight characters. Then we're going to stick in one special character, which we actually want to know. And then we have ourselves actually a very simple to remember password. It is the concept of how you create a password that we're trying to actually teach you here. Now you can use that concept for any animal, elephant, giraffe, rhinoceros, right? So when you start to think how many animals that you could actually create passwords for, you could then tie a password to, or an animal, should I say, to every single password requirement that you need. And it's easy to remember, well, that site's actually a rhinoceros, that site's actually a giraffe, right? And then how do I actually do giraffe? Well, it'd be a lowercase g, a capital case i, and go through your same process. What I'd like you to do is in the chat session, if you can actually tell me, um, anybody actually got any ideas as to how long it would take to crack a password like that? Can you show me a chat, Darren? Yeah. Anybody want to actually have a guess? One says centuries. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any others that actually would like to actually have a guess as to how many it would actually, 100 days? Yep. So we've got any others? I'd like to get a little bit of a feedback just to try to get people to understand how long it might take to crack something like this. I mean, it is actually a dictionary-based character, granted, but it does actually have upper and lower case. Another one says 30 days, Pete. Yep. Okay, so... What we're actually looking at here is this would take 400 years to crack this password. Now that may surprise some people, right? And that, I can show you how to test this as well. This will actually be in the information I provide. So let's look at a different type of password process. This one, we're gonna actually start with actually a phrase. Right? Crazy hackers won't guess this password 2019. And we take the first letter of each one of these uh, characters for crazy hackers won't guess this password. Password being actually uppercase and then 20 special character and 19. Uh, it would take roughly around 34,000 years though to crack this password because it's more randomly generated, right? There's no tie off actually to an alphabetical listing. Okay, so this is the third example. Anyone actually have a guess as to, I love my job? How many days, weeks, months, years would it actually take to crack a password like that? Right, so we've got, anybody want to actually put up a, a few guesses? Five minutes, <laughs> one day. Yep, you know, I've actually seen a couple of actually even shorter ones than that, right? So, okay. Let me actually give you a little insight. It would take 923,000 years to crack that password. Now people would go, how the heck is that possible? You need to understand actually the methodology of a password and what it actually is, right? So in this password, if you have a look at it, we actually have an uppercase character, which is the I. We have lowercase characters, and we actually have three special characters, right? Which is actually the space bar. The fact that it's three of the same special character is irrelevant. The way, the way passwords are hashed and the way that they are actually recorded on a computer, this password is actually, if you look at it, has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 characters in total. It has an uppercase, lowercase, and three special characters, which makes it a very hard password to crack. So what it's trying to actually explain here is that you don't have to make your passwords really complicated. What you do need to do is make them easily to remember. I would also suggest you now, Pete, don't use the password of my job. Yeah, <laughs> don't use that one because everyone knows that one now. So what I always say to people as well is try to treat your passwords like your underpants, right? 
you should change them often. You should not leave them lying around and you should definitely not try not share them. <laughs> right. So using strong pins or passwords, you keep them personal, keep them safe, use a different password, ideally for business and personal use. Now, the one thing I actually see a lot of as well is people reusing passwords. So we see Google, Microsoft, Dropbox, PayPal, Apple, Adobe, Facebook, Wells Fargo, uh, Bank of America, local banks, um, and Yahoo. Now, the problem that we actually have with that is that obviously if a hacker has managed to get a password of one system, there is software already available on the dark web that will say, check this password against this account on every one of those social media type solutions. So never ever use the same password because if they can get into one system and you actually have shared that you've reused that password, that means they have got into another system. We did have one lady who was using um, the similar email and they managed to get into her Gmail account. She used her Gmail account to authenticate every other system's password change. The challenge was because they got into her email account, they then did a change password on all of her other accounts, wait till it came through with Gmail, clicked on the link, and then actually changed her passwords on all of her banking systems. Uh, because the Gmail was actually not something she used as a regular solution, she never saw actually the emails coming through stating that there was a password change requirement. This is because she also didn't have two-factor authentication set up. So I found out actually the hard way. So what our recommendation is, is to use a password manager. Now for do-it-yourself password managers, I would consider LastPass or Dashlanes. Now these are two very good products actually out in the market. Most people should either know of them or they should actually be using them. I recommend these actually to my family and friends actually for a do-it-yourself home use program. I even have my uh, kids actually using this. With Virtual IT, we also run a fully managed business grade password manager called PassPortal. Now the Pass Portal actually gives us the ability that one, we can set up personalized uh, vaults for actually a corporation. So each person within the corporation can have their own password manager vault, but there is also an overarching company password solution, which you can share passwords actually between. And it also allows us actually as an IT company, if we are managing your solutions, that we can actually share passwords of your backend IT structure with you so that you have full visibility of your own system. In other words, as an IT provider, we don't look to actually retain and hold your uh, passwords without your uh, ability to be able to view them. Now, the beauty about Passportal though, it is fully audited. So that should you decide to actually uh, do what I call is the break glass solution and look actually at the master password that gets into everything, we would know about it. And then we would actually be able to question you as to why you needed to actually do that. Now, if it was to obviously um, move on to another uh, managed service provider, then that's all fair and good. That's part of the game that we're in. If it was because somebody just wanted to actually uh, look and see if they could actually understand what the password was, we would consider that actually a breach and change all of the internal passwords to actually our IT system. So moving forward, let's actually try to understand now the making up of a domain. If you remember, the lady came up and she ended up changing the IT, uh, the URL, the address of Qualcomm from an I to an L, right? So to understand how these happen, you need to actually look at how a domain is broken up. So you read a domain from backwards to front, so C, B and A. So if you are looking actually at sites that look similar to the um, school, the uh, Oakey school, you'll notice that actually it's Oakey school with an I, not an L. So obviously the, this one is the correct one. The same with actually a Ford Buyers Right Club. If you actually have a look at the Ford.com, this is actually the solution. If you actually understand the top one for Ford Buyers Right, the site you're going to is not Ford, it's buyersright.com. So it's those type of tricks that people actually need to be aware of is how a domain is registered. So we look at actually abbreviations as well. When you actually get a lot of these uh, bitly uh, short communications, be very aware of those because if you can't see where you're going, that could lead you anywhere. If you have a look at the um, cyber security ventures, you know exactly where you're going. You know actually the URL on the domain and when you hover over it, it tells you exactly the same, uh, the same URL. 
If you have a look at a bit.ly, unfortunately, it does not. It only tells you the hidden mask name, which means that you could click on that and literally go to a malware site or even actually authenticate it to download a, a ransomware. So be very cautious when you click on these bit.ly's and make sure that you know who it's from and it is something you should expect. Our recommendation is to never click on them. So web searches. These are really good when you actually are doing a URL um, or a search on the internet. The top where it talks about actually what the site is, be very aware that the site name right up the top is anything that actually a, um, a web developer can change. It's more about actually the link actually below the name that you should be looking for. You should be looking at where that name goes. Don't just click actually on the wording on the top. Be aware of the domain or the, the website it is going to to make sure it is what you expect to go. If you're ever concerned about that, you can actually use these really great tools on the web. One's called Virus Total. Don't worry too much about actually jumping onto this one. I will actually give you these details at the end of this slide deck and show you all of these places you can go. Incident response. So what do I do if something really bad happens? Well, this is where we actually talk about if your browser starts um, acting really weird, going to websites you don't expect, right? Someone's telling you they've received emails from you that you didn't send. Pop-ups are telling you that your computer's infected. Computer slows down immediately after clicking something or you suddenly get overloaded with junk mail, right? First step is unplug the computer. This is critical. Don't turn your computer off, right? Most people would actually say, hey, look, just turn your computer off, turn it on. If you actually have got yourself a virus or a malware, in some situations, turning it off actually will wipe any forensic evidence of what we can do to actually fix it. So our recommendation is to turn your computer, leave your computer on, unplug the internet cable, and then give us a, take a photograph of the screen, whatever the pop-up is or the website that it tried to direct you to. If you're disconnected from the internet, you're not gonna see any more damage, right? And then we can actually help you with the instructions as to what you can do next, right? Based on what the event is. So this actual page is the useful resources I was talking about. This will be sent to you in a slide deck. So uh, a PDF, we will actually send all of these links. The top one will actually be a good way for you to check whether your, um, your email address has actually been sold or is available for sale on the dark web, right? The second one is actually uh, will tell you how secure your password is. Uh, you can test those other passwords that I tried before against that and that will give you a similar number, right? The third one, the virus tool one, is a really good website to actually understand that you can check emails, you can check attachments, you can check um, URLs of websites. It will, it is a government sponsored site, so therefore it will tell you whether in fact these solutions are safe to actually go to. Some interesting articles can be read on the cyber newsletter, um, Curbs on Security. Obviously the uh, cyber.gov.au has some amazing information in regards to notifiable data breaches and how to stay smart online. And then we also have the Australian Cyber Security um, Centre, which gives actually advice on how to set up remote workers. So these useful resources are quite helpful. But what I'm also finding is that there are a massive amount of vendor deals out right now. And these are only a few that I found in the last 48 hours. Uh, and these are coming out constantly. So obviously WebEx is offering a free 90-day uh, WebEx services to people actually working from home. Um, TrueGrid actually is offering secure remote access for anyone working at home, 15 days free trials and a 20% discount on purchase. Sofos is offering, obviously, the home commercial edition to any Sofos customers. <coughs> Australia Post are offering, obviously, the 24-7 um, parcel lockers now for pickup and sending of parcels. And you can also see that Veeam are offering a free backup solution to uh, back up your desktops and computer systems. The security awareness uh, work from home deployment kit is available, and there is actually a hyperlink on that uh, that you can actually click on to download. And you'll see that other vendors, including Microsoft, Cisco, Adobe, have all rallied to offer free versions of their products. Now, I'm also seeing that companies alongside ServiceNow, Telstra, Google, and Facebook are also providing teleworkers and virtual, uh, with virtual meeting resources uh, for Australian business communities. Now, this is all to help actually um, uh, plow through this pandemic that we're all going through right now. So there is plenty of options out there. 
obviously um, you need advice. We're here to actually give you some uh, guidance in that. So what we're actually talking about is we'd like to offer um, this group a special offer of our own. Now I've done some uh, heavy number crunching and trying to work out the best way of presenting it so that we can secure home-based single user systems at a cost-effective price. Now with this solution, we've actually called it our CSI solution, which is the Cyber Security Infosphere. We're offering obviously 24 by seven by 365 network and system monitoring. We will be able to tell you whether your system um, needs an update and what patch management you need to actually uh, act on. We'll give a full online ticket portal system that you can obviously log tickets and communicate with us in the back end. Um, any work we actually do to um, help you from a help desk perspective will obviously be at a pay as you go, but we will be giving discounted rates on that. We will offer a full monitored antivirus and anti-malware solution, and we will also remediate. In other words, if you get a virus, we'll help you work through and fix that, and that'll actually be included in the charge. We will offer a full cyber threat protection solution to protect you from the ransomwares, and if something bad actually happens on your network, there will be dark web monitoring for your company emails, and we will also include personal emails in this as well. So in case you actually have a Hotmail or a Gmail account as well, if that's uh, gonna be found on the dark web, we will notify you of that. Uh, we will also be offering web browsing and internet protection so that you won't be able to go to the really bad sites. We'll be able to block that. There will be an online tutorial we'll be sending you a link for that will give you the ability to train yourself. And it's actually a proper tutorial. You watch videos, you answer questions, and you sit actually a little bit of a study exam and you get a certificate. Then there will also be a live training event that I will be holding two each year, whereas we will actually invite all people down to an event. We'll put on some uh, drinks and some nibblies, and get everybody into a room and look at actually doing a live training event. And then there will also be a monthly newsletter. So this is all designed and priced actually for the sole traders. This is, this is not a business or commercial grade solution. This is designed really for sole traders who want to actually protect um, their, uh, their systems. Now it's aimed to actually assess, implement, manage and advise on cybersecurity protection for businesses like you. We deliver actually quality tried and trusted solutions to provide real time measurable risks and reduction to your business. And we use extensive experience with an eye on innovative technology. So we're here to help protect your business. So the thing to move forward with this is there's, there's four easy steps to your protection, right? One would be to email contacts, uh, email your contact details to contact at vitms.com.au, right? I'll actually be in contact with you to discuss the offer in detail and answer any questions. This is not a sign up, this is actually first off, just to actually answer questions and find out whether in fact this is actually right for you, right? On your first payment, Right, we'll actually be doing a uh, credit card um, uh, recurring payment. Uh, you will receive access to the, all the CSI member benefits. We'll install the software. There's no charge actually for our services to actually do any of this. And then after that, you can rest easy knowing your business is protected. So I'd like to thank you actually for your time uh, during this session. And if there's any uh, questions that people would like to ask. Thanks very much for that, Peter. That's. Um scary informative but there's always some light at the end of the tunnel and just 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 to confirm that this is also designed for those employees as well who are working from home um not only in the office as well so it's a really really good opportunity to take advantage of um of your offer thank you very much for that um really appreciate you taking the time to talking to to the to the um attendees today with respect to this now a couple of questions that have come through uh Pete, is one is um um, as far as as far as the employees home home computers, what other things um, can can the can the employer track what they're logging in log, logging into um, um, as well during that uh, making sure that they everything is safe. And secondly, what is the um, um, opportunity with respect to um, having a like um, a VPN? Is it, is it an advantage having a VPN? Right. Okay. So from working from home, obviously what we're seeing a lot of people wanting to do is to be able to use their home based computer and be able to remote into their work computer so that they can continue as usual. Now RDP, uh, most people actually 
uh, would understand that there is a remote desktop protocol within Windows and also actually on uh, server grades. The challenge with RDP is that there is a, a new threat that was put out in April of 2019 called Blue Keep. Blue Keep actually made RDP protocol extremely vulnerable to hackers and attackers and so forth. There has been now some new solutions that are brought out and one actually that we promote is obviously True Grid. The advantage of this is that it is a fully encrypted solution. It doesn't use the normal RDP protocols and it uses full two-factor authentication. From this, you can, actually, you can connect your work computer, you can map your home drive, you can map your home printer, you can share files between, you can transfer files between, and you can actually have a fully shared desktop all in a secured environment, all backed up by a two-factor authentication and any domain accounts. Those type of solutions work out extremely cheap and we can talk about those and discuss them later. There are other options. The other uh, simpler options would be using TeamViewer and making sure you tie your TeamViewer account to a two-factor authenticator. And ideally, if you can tie it down to a specific machine that is only allowed to connect up to that, the disadvantage I find with TeamViewer is the unique ID doesn't change no matter um, how long you actually have had it. You can't change the ID. So if somebody was to learn that ID, they can then do a brute force attack. Right? In other words, try to keep trying until they figure out your password. Hence why two-factor authentication is absolutely mandatory nowadays. Now, I've had another question, which is um, whether there is actually... Um, uh, other what services. we do actually for other services to help safeguard employees' home computers. As I said, the, the areas that we try to help with protecting home computers um, that is actually outside of the uh, CSI club or the CSI membership is obviously we do um, antivirus, uh, anti-malware, we do the uh, cyber security, we do the dark web monitoring, and we try to teach our people how to actually use their devices. Um, the, the last thing that we are now looking at and spending more time on is with the web browser proxying. Now, this means that what we do is we put an agent on your computer that helps to define or to work out which PC or sorry, which website you're going to and whether that website is safe to travel to or not. So if it actually obviously is not a safe site, it would actually block you from this. Okay. Um, anything else? Not seeing any other questions. Believe actually we've got everybody covered. Look, I'd really like to thank everybody for their time. We've had a huge attendance to this event. It, it's been a massive turnout and lots of uh, people have um, uh, been involved and actually given us some good feedback. So hopefully uh, if you can, as I said, contact us at vitms.com.au. Um, I'm happy to answer any of your questions, spend a bit of time like us. We're also working from home. So we have an opportunity to uh, sit back, relax, have a coffee and see if we can help you in these situations, okay? Thank you very much, Peter, for, for that. And um, thank, thank you again for um, spending the time to talking to, to the attendees today. Uh, please consider and take advantage of um, Peter's um, offer. It's, um, it's, a, it's a great offer. And um, hopefully that you, know, you can take advantage and, and talk to him about more about um, any issues or um, queries that you may have. Um, on behalf of Your Business First and Virtual IT Managed Services, thank you very much for your time. Please stay safe, um, look after yourself, look after your team, look after your family, and uh, we'll see you at the next webinar. Take care, everybody.